Welcome to the session on higher education models for Turkey. My name is Erhan Erkut. I'll be chairing the session. We're starting the sessions with remarks from our new YÖK president, Professor Gökhan Çetinsaya. Gökhan Hocam, the floor is yours. Dear colleagues and friends, I would like to thank, first of all, Professor Haluk Ünal, president of Turkish American Scientists and Scholars Association, for his kind invitation to participate in this conference and TASA members for their efforts to bring such a select group of people together. I also thank all participants from the United States and Turkey to make this event a success. Dear friends, I will keep my remarks short because I am here not to deliver a long speech, but to hear your views, opinions, and suggestions. Now let me briefly share my first observations as the president of Higher Education Council, which was established 30 years ago. Today, the Turkish higher education system faces new opportunities as well as new challenges. I urge all of you to think about these issues and questions to draw a new roadmap that would strengthen our universities and make them more competitive. First, I would like to address emerging opportunities that the higher education system enjoys in Turkey. In recent years, the Turkish higher education system has experienced a remarkable growth. The, the expansion in higher education sector through the establishment of new universities, opening new programs, and increasing the number of incoming students should be recorded as an accomplishment. As of today, there are 103 state universities, 62 foundation universities in Turkey. At the moment, applications for new foundation universities are also considered by the Council. The expansion and growth in higher education sector enabled thousands of students in waiting to have easier access to university education. I believe that this is a significant step in the right direction given the fact that there is a positive correlation between higher education and social mobility, economic development, technological and scientific progress. Turkey's ability to compete with the rest of the world very much depends on its human capital. As the world's 16th and Europe's sixth biggest economy, Turkey needs a better educated human capital to consolidate this situation and its position. Recent growth in the higher education system also brought about changes, chances, sorry, also brought about chances for aspiring young researchers and academics to enter the job market. Moreover, establishment of new public foundation, new public and foundation universities led to diversification and competition for higher education institutions to recruit students and staff. As far as the number of university students is concerned, we have the following picture. There are more than 2 million university students enrolled at all levels in Turkey, excluding distance education students. Half a million of them are studying at the higher vocational schools, while just more than a million are registered for four-year degree programs. We have at the moment just over 100,000 master students and 40,000 PhD students. Of these students, only of these students, only 10% are at the foundation universities. With the increase in the number of universities, a new window of, of, of opportunity was opened for academic staff and students. That is the mobility, both in Turkey and abroad. Mobility of our academic staff 
and students is strongly encouraged and supported by the Higher Education Council. These are some of the opportunities before our higher education system. Dear colleagues, now I would like to turn to some questions and challenges that the higher education system faces in Turkey. I will here only address three of these challenges due to limited time. The first challenge is the issue of quality. As I have noted earlier, we have witnessed a significant growth in the higher education system. Now it's time to think carefully on the question of providing inno innovative education, conducting cutting edge research and producing first class publications. This is all about the quality of higher education in Turkey. We need to make sure that especially newly established universities in Turkey must invest in establishing quality mechanisms while the older institutions should improve their existing systems. I would like to inform you at this stage that there is a healthy debate going on in Turkey about the quality assurance systems and different models of quality assurance system and which one Turkey should adopt or Turkish universities should adopt. The second challenge is the issue of internationalization. Social, economic, political and global changes turned Turkey into a regional power and a global player in recent years. Turkey's economic relations with the neighboring countries and its trade volume with the United States European Union, Africa, and other regions are increasing. In this context, universities are expected to graduate ex universities are expected to graduate students with such knowledge and skills that contribute to Turkey's global competition. Therefore, we should open our education system to the world outside. In order to achieve this objective, we need to send our students and academic staff outside the country while attracting bright foreign students and researchers to Turkey. In this context, the reverse brain drain will be encouraged for scholars of Turkish origin to return to Turkey for research and teaching either in, the sh either in a short period or in a long term uh, frameworks. The third and most important issue is reforming the higher education system. As you all know, the Higher Education Council was established after a military intervention in Turkey in the early 1980s. Therefore, it carries the imprint of that period. Today, there is a consensus across all social sectors and political views that a comprehensive higher education reform is needed. Drawing on such a broad consensus, we need to work on a new roadmap that is based on rational debates rather than ideological positions. I am hopeful and optimistic that if we can cooperate and share our experiences, positive steps can be taken in the right direction. So, I would like to end my remarks here with this hope. And once more, I would like to thank all of you for your contributions. Thank you. Erhan Hocam. Thank you, Professor Çetinsaya. When I was asked to chair a panel on higher education models in Turkey, I thought it might be a good idea to frame the debate or the panel uh, based on a, an existing document, a document which I read for the first time before becoming president of Özgen University. 
Um, it was first written in 2006, but uh, it, it underwent a number of uh, public debates and, and discussion with union leaders, business leaders, academics, and it took its final form in 2008. It's called Neden Yeni Bir Yüksek Öğretim Vizyonu. And uh, the four co-authors are Professor Üstün Ergüder, Professor Mehmet Şahin, Professor Tosun Terzioğlu, and Professor Ökten Vardar. The, the document, what I like about the document is it offers a roadmap. It doesn't prescribe a certain strategy, but it offers a roadmap. And it makes an effort to assume away the constraints imposed by the law 2547. Uh, it's basically a, a, a food for thought, a food for further discussion and debate. And although three years have passed, almost four years have passed since the first publication of the report, much of what is in the report is still valid. There are some changes which we will talk about, but much of it is still valid. And I thought this would be a good idea to center the panel uh, on this document. And in case you haven't read this, it's, uh, you can just type the, the title into Google and uh, you can download the PDF. I recommend you take a, a good look at it. Now, uh, I, I'm very lucky to have been able to convince two of the original four co-authors to join this panel. Uh, and I would like to invite Professor Üstün Ergüder and Professor Ökten Vardar to take their seats on the panel. The way we are going to do this is, uh, please, um, there's going to be 40 minutes of uh, uh, questions in the form of a TV format or, or Davos format uh, with the two original co-authors. And then we will invite the university presidents who are in attendance and vice rectors uh, to join the panel. And they will have an opportunity to uh, voice their opinions uh, and provide their answers uh, to some of this, uh, some of the material that that's been debated. All of the questions I'm going to pose are uh, emanating from the the original document. Now you do know the the bios of uh, distinguished professors uh, Ergüder and, and and Vardar. I will not. Uh, repeat them, but, but I will point out that they're both affiliated with Magna Carta, uh, which is an institution for academic freedoms and institutional autonomy. In fact, Professor Aguilar chairs Magna Carta, and Oktem uh, if I'm not mistaken, is the general secretary of was, was. was general secretary of Magna Carta. <laughs> so that recently. that also provides us with a with an international angle to uh, to the debate. Now, my my opening question to you is: uh, We're going back to the sort of beginnings of this, of this debate, uh, creation of this document. And as uh, Professor Chetinsire mentioned, uh, there was a, a law written under extraordinary circumstances back in 1981. And uh, the goals of this law were, one, depoliticize the Turkish university system. Two, produce graduates who internalized ideals and values of the Turkish Republic and the revolution. In other words, build, use the university as a nation building device. Three, increase academic output of Turkish universities, typically measured in, in number of papers and citations. Four, increase university capacity in Turkey, overall supply, as well as penetration. Uh, my question to Professor Vardar is, to what extent do you think these goals have been achieved, sir? Uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, first let me thank you for inviting me to this panel and also TASA. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to share my views on Turkish higher education with you. Um, the law had passed in 1981, and there were basically two major influences at that time. And they were the rise of managerial model at that time, arguing that collegial model is insufficient it is both slow and not responsive enough. And the other influence was the military regime trying to bring a central control. Now, as a result of that, the goals that you have cited um, were kind of inscribed into the, into the law. Now, as far as the depoliticizing of Turkish um, universities, 
I don't think this was a deliberate um, goal of the law, but it was a byproduct. And uh, nation building, well, that I again see as uh, one of the standing aims of higher education laws, in fact, in 19th and 20th century. And the other ones, increasing of academic output and increasing university capacity, uh, my answer to those would be yes. Uh, the academic output has increased, but not as, a, as much as number of publications indicate. And the university capacity has also increased, but not as much as the number of seats indicate. Thank you. So you seem to think there have, have been some positive outcomes of the law. Uh, Ustun Hocam, in what ways has this law been detrimental to the growth of the Turkish higher education system? I'll take the opposite question for you. I'll try to be very, very uh, unbiased. Because it's a good thing. In 1982, when the law was, in 1981, when the law was enacted, we as academics really reacted to the law because we thought it dealt a very heavy blow to the autonomy of, of, of institutions. It created an over, it created. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'll talk into it, okay. And uh, we thought that it, did, it dealt a very heavy blow to uh, the autonomy of the institutions their ability to run themselves and to strategically manage themselves, and that it created a bureaucracy in Turkey. And as a political scientist, I'm very wary of bureaucracies that have been created at the center because they have a, kept, they have a tendency to really perpetuate themselves, and which has happened, I think. And uh, so, this is, these are my biases. But then I served as a rector under the system. Now, the term was really try to salvage something from the system to really emphasize the autonomy of the institution to be, to be able to chart its own, uh, own destiny, as I, as I would say. Uh, I think the law at the time, as Ekta mentioned uh, very correctly, it served a purpose. It served a purpose. Now this is my, uh, I'm trying to get rid of my biases. It increased schooling in Turkey. It put research on the agenda in Turkey. And I think one of the very positive things that it did was the establishment of foundation universities. Because I think back uh, to my uh, term as a rector in, in the in between 1992 and 2000. And I don't know what kind of rectorship it would have been if Bilkent first and then Koch and then Sabancı University did not come into being. It created a competitive environment in Turkey. This is, I think, I think it was a very important, a very positive contribution. Now when you, uh, uh, your question is about in what ways the law, uh, the system, the 2547, uh, is detrimental to the higher education system right now. In the report, we argue that we, we try to be very unbiased in talking about the pros and cons of the report. What I think is that continuation of the system right now, putting the Turkish higher education system into a straight jacket is very, very detrimental. We really have to rethink. This is why we called it, why a new vision for the higher education system. Because the system by itself, the country itself, is becoming diversified. The country is assuming, uh, is assuming a, a very important role in the global world of ours, where technology is very dominant. So we need the creative, creative uh, capacities in the universities we need universities to compete with each other in producing programs, in, in coming up with innovative, uh, innovative programs within the universities, innovative academic structures. So I think the system right now is putting a straight jacket. And my predictions as a political scientist, unfortunately, has been, uh, has been is being realized. 
in the sense that the YÖK bureaucracy, the Higher Education Council bureaucracy, is growing and is becoming more bureaucratized. There's a more, there's much more, I mean, I, when I served as a rector in the, in the uh, during the uh, 1990s, um, the system had its problems. But I don't see some of the interference in academic affairs that YÖK of today is undertaking. So this is a message that I want to deliver to our new president of the Higher Education Council. One of the problems with the higher education system in Turkey, I look at, I mean, this report is, is an attempt to think out of the box, all right? But the box itself seems to be a very sturdy box. I mean, the walls around it seem to be very entrenched. And it also, everybody is critical of the system, but when you want to change it, Everybody likes the system. <laughs> don't, don't believe in the rhetoric. In the rhetoric, everybody complains, including myself. But then when it's about time to change, nobody wants to change it, including the academics, who are very, very critical of the system. But then when you come up with a proposal, everybody says, no, no, no. I mean, there's no attempt to change the system. So I find it as a, as a design, as a bureaucratic, as a political design, a marvelous system that seems to perpetuate itself. And, uh, and politically too, I mean, Ektem said the system was designed as a, as a non-political system. No, during those days it was. But now it is such a big prize with 165 universities and still counting, as our president said. Uh, it's, it's a big prize. It's a big prize to capture politically. And the, the system that was designed those days with, an assume, with a president who was assumed to be non-political is not correct anymore. So it's about time, I think, to think about, um, uh, to think about a new system. And if you ask me, what will be the parameters of the new system? I'll answer that later on. <laughs> So you, you single out the straight jacket, the sturdy box, and uh, the York bureaucracy as Very the sturdy box. As, the, <laughs> as the disadvantages of the new law. Now, in, in part one of the document, old you law. the old law, old yes, law. yes. Uh, in part one of the document, you list global changes um, to uh, global trends uh, to higher education, and Professor Chetan I mentioned a few. Uh, taking some liberty, I've reduced your 14 into 12, and I'm going to try to classify those 12 into three groups. Uh, the four where we have done well, the four where we have done poorly, and the four that are sort of in the middle. So I'm going to ask you to pick up on two of those, two each, where you think we've done well, and two each where you think we have not done as well. The, the, the 12 global trends are European Union and the Bologna process, knowledge society, massification of higher education, increased demand, continuing education, Increased student mobility, Erasmus and otherwise. Increased competition among universities. Diversification and specialization in the system. Paradigm shift in relations with the state. Multicultural, multidisciplinary education. Entrepreneurial university. Social responsibility in university education. And finally, accreditation and quality control. So, Ekdem Ojan, can I ask you to name two where you think we've done well and two where we, you think we have not done as well? Well, I looked at the list and I picked two where we have done well. I can say massification and increased student mobility. Those are the two points we did fairly well. Uh, I was hesitant to pick two where we did kind of badly. I just had to choose four. <laughs> Go for Sorry. it. <laughs> Knowledge society, diversification, paradigm shift, and accreditation. I think we did pretty badly in all those four. OK, uh, thank you, Ekten Hocam. Mr. Hocam? I would say massification and EU and the Bologna process. Hmm. Uh, Bologna process, 
thanks to the universities that have been established, modeled on the American model in Turkey, the Middle East Technical University, uh, Boğaziçi University, and uh, I would say Atatürk University in Erzurum. Because Bologna process, please don't tell this to the Europeans, Bologna process is an attempt to ape the American model. Is, but if you tell them to Europeans, they don't like it. <laughs> And the Turkish universities have been ready for it. And I've been a quality evaluator for the European University Association. And I've visited many European universities, uh, evaluated them, Italian universities, Portuguese universities, Spanish universities, and some uh, in Eastern European, Eastern European countries. They are not ready at all, especially Italians, the Greeks. <laughs> They are not ready for the Bologna process. Turkey is far ahead. That's why I say Turkey has come a long way in terms of, but we started, we started from a much better position in Turkey. Thanks to the switch in our, thanks uh, to the switch in our attention towards over the Atlantic. I mean, Turkey in higher education for a long time flew over Europe and Atlantic and landed in the US. And we were not very cognizant of the European system. So this is one. Massification, of course, the, the major goal of the higher education system, law 2547, was massification. I think we've done a, we've done a very good job on that. And uh, where we have not done properly uh, well is the, our president talked about accreditation and quality control. I've been a rector in the 90s, and we picked up as a university uh, ABET accreditation, as, uh, and other universities did it as well. We picked up EUA uh, quality review, and since then, quality and accreditation has been discussed in Turkey without much being done. Mm. We seem to be, as Turks, very good in discussing things and knowing what is right to do, but we have take a long time in, in really uh, implementing them. So. Uh, I see that as a major problem, and perhaps I place a lot of hope on uh, President Chetan Sayer's term that these things would be uh, realized, realized in Turkey. Of course, diversification, yes or no? Diversification is happening, is happening de facto in Turkey. With the, in, with the introduction of uh, foundation universities, but diversification is not happening among the public universities, the 103 of them. One of my problems in serving as the rector of Bosphorus University was, if you go and ask for innovative support for innovative projects from the government, what they tell you is, from the Higher Education Council, from the Ministry of Finance, so on and so forth, they tell you, is, of course, as an institution, you can do that. But the others, developing in universities, cannot do it. So mediocrity, leveling at the mediocrity. So that's a major, major problem for public universities. Public universities should be given the opportunity to make their own strategic plans, design their own academic structure, innovate in terms of programs and education and research. This does not exist. Uh, I think the foundation universities can do that a lot more easy. Okay, you both seem to point out diversification and uh, relations with the state as areas where we could be doing a little better. Uh, in fact, in part two of the document, you discuss forces of change in Turkish higher education. Based on demographic trends, you anticipate increased pressure for quantity and quality, and you argue for diversification to meet the demand. Uh, Mr. Rajam just mentioned one form of diversification, foundation versus public universities. And you also suggest a shift, a paradigm shift in the role of the state. Um, if you like, you could uh, expand on these issues and perhaps you could uh, mention what the most significant barrier is that impedes change. We both, you both seem to argue that we need more diversification and more specialization. Why can't we do it? You both seem to suggest that there is a need for a paradigm shift in relations with the state. Why can't we do it? Hector Mojam? Uh, strong central support seems to be in our genes. Mm. Uh, the political power prefers central control, higher education council, as well as rectors. 
And we have to admit that change is difficult. Academic institutions are known to mimic each other. If you let them alone, they move along the most prestigious lines, which is called mission drift. So I think mm. it is not enough to set them loose. There should be incentives so that they differentiate, diversify. Mm. I think diversification is the most important, probably the important issue in higher education, in Turkish higher education today. I can't overemphasize it, and I wish I could talk for, for an hour about diversification, because I truly believe that without diversification, we cannot solve our problems. Do you think we need more types of universities? Definitely. Um, well, the, the new public management basically says, uh, <clears throat> give autonomy, ask for ac accountability, establish checks and balances, and a competitive environment. Now, we have 165 universities. Soon it will be 200. To me, it's impossible to run the system with one set of rules. It is very customary that we talk about particular issues like how do we appoint or elect the president. To me, that question cannot be answered without recognizing certain groups, categories, types, whatever you call. <coughs> so we have to come up with groups which satisfies everybody such that within the group we can have certain general rules, regulations. So I think it is impossible to provide consistent solutions um, without really finding out these different groups. It's a very difficult issue, but we tend to talk about the general principles all the time. Everybody agrees that diversity is very important, but nobody talks about the details of the diversity. Remember that we have 165 universities, and 50% of those universities are six and a half years old or younger. younger. Just alone, this piece of uh, information uh, makes it compulsory to to, to have different categories. Um, I don't want to go into the details now, but if you ask, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Leading the moderator. <laughs> now, you both seem to argue for diversification and, and specialization, not only within state universities, but also across the range of types of universities. Oh, including uh, vocational education. Vocational education, uh, for-profit universities, yes. um, yes. discipline-based universities, yes. distance education. It's maybe just another minute. We, we not only need it for system steering, but we also need it for um, simplification of information. We have to supply this information to the client. What type of universities we have? And another thing that is really crucial is meeting the uh, flagship aspiration of, uh, of systems. Uh, I'm sure someday um, the government in Turkey will need to identify flagship universities to compete in rankings in international recognition and so forth. So there are many reasons why we should go after a true diversification, not just uh, private versus public. It, it seems to me, though, that this diversification specialization argument is intimately linked to this paradigm shift with the, uh, in the role of the state. Uh, Ustunajam, could you perhaps further comment on why is the state impeding diversification and specialization, if you think it is? Well, yes, I think it is. Um, well, you're really egging me on to be a political scientist. <laughs> you lead me, I lead uh, you. It's a dance. <laughs> well, you know, when we talk about a lot of political scientists in Turkey write about the uh, bureaucratic uh, state 
the states, uh, the father states. And uh, I think, well, in, very briefly, I think Turkey has a state system which is very control freak. Top down, control oriented, always assuming that quality would come through control, which is totally wrong, I think. Let me cite you an example. I mean, I agree with almost all of the things that Ökdem said, so I'm not going to go back to them. All I'm going to say is that <coughs> Turkey, in this day and age, is facing two challenges, higher education system. One is still massification. Turkey is still a young country, but the statistics, population statistics, tells us that it will be easing gradually towards 2025 on the higher education system. So it's time to think about quality. Higher education, law 2547 was about massification, but I think from this day onwards, we have to devise a system in which Turkish higher education system would be able to grow in leaps and bounds in terms of quality. This is very, very important. That's why diversification is important. But again, this paradigm, the control freak paradigm, it just bothers me a lot. Uh, let me give you one example. I, when I came to this, when I, I wouldn't say I came to this country, when I went from this country to Turkey, back in 1969, I came up with a system, the, the so-called associate professorship system, in which there's a very centralized system. You take examinations, and then you're awarded your docentship, and docentship is like an aristocratic title that goes with you to the grave, all right? Um, but the system, you know, when the system is so centralized uh, that I don't think it is achieving what, what, it, what it has to achieve. And I have, since then, I, I always have argued that associate professorship should be passed out by the universities themselves. And the, the title of associate professorship should be valid in the university. When you're leaving the university, leave the title at the gate. All right, and go out as a doctor or what, what have you. And, uh, but again, to this day, this is a very controversial argument. If I make this argument in Turkey, I always get, but how are you going to ensure quality? Now, since 1969 up to this day, some, nobody can really prove to me that the system ensures quality. It doesn't. It is, it is such a heterogeneous system that in some cases you get good docentships, in others, you know, people just, I don't want to go into details of it, but it's very, very difficult to establish, uh, you know, to enforce quality. So, you know, there are other cases of a university being, uh, or the system being a uh, control freak. You know, every, and the system, I'm not, I'm not really accusing any organization, state organization. We as Turks are control mm. freaks. Mm. I of see course. rectors, even rectors of foundation universities feeling naked if there isn't enough state control, yeah. if there isn't enough association with the state. And if I'm offending anybody, please forgive me. I've reached the age of 75. I can say almost anything <laughs> I want to say. All right, I, I'd like to I like the luxury of that. I really enjoy it. <laughs> and a few years ago, when the uh, Higher Education Council president sitting here, I couldn't have, I couldn't have been so outspoken. <laughs> so perhaps there is progress after all. Yes. Uh, I'd, I'd like to turn to financial resources. Uh, we all know that education is expensive. And uh, I'd like to mention a few figures to just set the stage. Currently, Turkey spends 1.1% of its GDP on higher education, and the corresponding number in the US is 2.7. The budget is split among more and more universities and more and more students. In 1992, there were only 28 state universities. Now there's 103, so three and a half fold increase. Perhaps something that's even more controversial, a 2005 study by TED suggests that the nation spends 2.9 billion dollars on university exam preparation, that's Dersane money, and 2.7 billion dollars on its universities. It seems Turkey offers quote unquote free higher education, but the students have to pay a princely sum to get in. 
Now, I would like you to comment on financing of higher education in Turkey. Uh, can the government afford high quality higher education with the targeted penetration rates of 60%? And who pays the, for, for this free higher education good? Is this system really equitable as it, it claims to be? Ökten Hocam? Um, the problem has been almost solved if you consider um, theoretically. It should be mixed public as well as private funding. Um, it is well accepted that higher education is both a public good and uh, private. Mm -hmm. And the problem is more political. It depends on the governments when to uh, put this in practice. Uh, theoretically, the, uh, the scheme ought to be those who can afford should pay, those who cannot afford if they are competent enough, they should get scholarship. If they are not, they should get credit. Mm. So the system is well known. It's a matter of political power to apply it and when to apply it. And certainly, you just suffer from the consequences. OK. Mr. Well, it's a, again a very hot potato uh, topic because we have really a, a myth in Turkey that free higher education is socially just. Now, in this report, I mean, if you download it and read it, we, I'm not an economist, but in Manchester I studied econ uh, economics as an undergraduate. I don't consider myself an economist because I did not do my PhD in, in, in economics. As far as I could understand from the data that economists have produced, Especially at, at higher education, we are really the system of free education, free at public universities. Public universities is not really very socially just. Because, I mean, a good colleague of mine, Mehmet Kaitas, produced a very important piece of research which shows that children who get early child education are more likely to, are more likely to be uh, university students and uh, th that has gone on to higher education. There is similar uh, data. For example, the report that Ted produced. Parents, Turks are spenders on education. I know a World Bank study done in 2004, World uh, Turkey, Turkey uh, Education Report by the World Bank. In the World Bank, there's a very, very interesting statistics. When you compare Turkish expenditures with the expenditures of OECD countries on education, public spending, betrayal. We are really behind. But when you look at the money that public, that public spends out of the pocket, private spending out of the pocket, Turkey is one of the highest spenders on education. Now this shows the education. It doesn't mean that this money is well spent. Hmm. One, of the, one of the indicators of, of, of it not being well spent is the uh, university entrance system. Dersane. Yeah, Dersane system. Now who goes to Dersane? Who is able to pay for these? All these are questions are begging an answer by, by economists. I mean, all the indirect data suggests that uh, there is a lot of injustice. That is, those who are better off can get into the university system. But uh, so the natural consequence of that, and this is the controversial part, is that even in public universities, we must have stiff public tuition. I, uh, we, have, we have to have tuition. Stiff is a too strong a word for it. But we have to have some kind of tuition. But again, there is a lot of inequality inequality of income and wealth in Turkey too. The system, you have to devise a system in which you can provide scholarships for students who cannot do it. You, ha you have to take from the rich and give it to the poor. We did at Bosphorus, you know, at Boğaziçi University some years ago an exercise on that. Because Boğaziçi University is a university in which uh, there are a lot of students who come with Mercedes's used to in the 90s, in BMW's mercy. And then there's a lot of students, about 1,000 among 10,000 
that was our estimate at the time, Kadri would know right now better, that who really could not pay for their, even the, for their lunch. Mm -hmm. All right? So we, designed, we devised a scholarship system. We tried to keep, for example, all the prices, uh, dorms, uh, food prices, and everything close to the market levels. It's very controversial. Because if you raise your food prices, you get a student boycott for a week or two. <laughs> and we had to devise the strategy of when to do it. The timing was June, when examinations start. Make <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and think about what the inflation would be next year, and, and then make the estimate, and then really jack up the price. And that, that, that helped. But then we devised a scholarship system in which we, we turned around and provided free food and free dorm, dorm space for the needy, uh, for those students who needed it. And there are plenty of them, too. So uh, Turkey needs a system in which you, can, you have to really charge those who want to study in the public system, who can pay tuition. And to those who cannot, you have to devise either a system of loans or, uh, or, a, or a scholarship, or a fellowship system. So this is my, uh, as an amateur economist, this is my answer to your, an attempt to answer your question. It's a very complicated one, a politically a very tough one. I don't know if I would be able to implement the ones, the things I'm saying if I'm in power. How about the uh, We'll take questions from the audience in, in due time. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, it, I, I don't mean to uh, enter the panel, but if I may suggest that the foundation yeah, universities yeah. are already taking from the rich and giving to the poor. So, so the model does exist in Turkey. Well, I didn't mention foundation yeah, universities. Yeah. Uh, you, you both uh, are quite well versed in institutional autonomy and academic freedoms. Um, you discussed several dimensions of autonomy in the report, actually. Uh, financial autonomy, uh, managerial autonomy, and so on. Uh, how does the Turkish university system fare under institutional uh, autonomy and academic freedoms? To me? We'll start with Ekta Moja first. Uh, pretty badly. I, I don't want to uh, elaborate. I'll just quote certain numbers. European University Association, EUA, published autonomous scorecard in November 2011. And they rated European <coughs> countries in four different areas. In organizational autonomy, Turkey was 27th out of 28. In financial autonomy, Turkey was 23rd out of 28. In staffing autonomy, 21st out of 28. In academic autonomy, 25th out of 28. Thanks to Greeks. <laughs> We are never the bottom one. <laughs> that, that's the situation in autonomy. Hocam, <laughs> do you want to continue commenting on autonomy or switch to academic freedoms, uh, perhaps? Autom OECD, there's a, similar, there's a similar OECD report, and Turkey, again, trails in terms of measures of autonomy. To me, autonomy, of course, is an academic. Academic freedom is terribly important if you want any kind of development in research and teaching, academic freedom is very important. We have to be guardians for it. And uh, institutional autonomy, institutional autonomy is terribly important too because I think in this day and age, to respond to technological change, to this diverse global world, Universities should be able to do their own strategic planning. They have to set, set their own visions, missions, and be able to spend accordingly. Now, during the days when I was director of a, of a public university, we had a line item budget. I mean, they told you so many machines you could buy, so much lab equipment you could buy. At the end of the year, if you did not, uh, I mean, there was some, uh, if there was some money left, you went ahead and buy both junk. And when I delivered my, you know, when I turned over my job in 2000 to my successor, there were, uh, there were portable typewriters, there were portable printers that we bought, but that we never used. 
We bought them because there was, uh, there was uh, money. money available. So it was, I mean, if you don't make, if you don't have financial autonomy, you can't make strategic planning. Strategy, I mean, in, these, in this day and age, the Higher Education Council asks the universities to do strategic planning. How are you going to do strategic planning if you can spend that money according to your uh, goals that have been set by you strategically? So this is, uh, I think, a very, very important point. Another important point, a measure of institutional autonomy in, uh, uh, is an ability to recruit your own students and an ability to recruit your own faculty, including research assistants. But the trend recently has been exactly the opposite way. I mean, the way things have gone recently in terms of recruitment of faculty, for example, research assistants have been taken over by the Higher Education Council. Terrible, I think. And I'm, I'm scared it might go into the faculty, you know, recruitment of faculty that being done centrally for public universities by the Higher Education Council. You don't, if, you don't have, have much say on how to recruit, how, do, how you recruit your students. Mm -hmm. I understand the pressure, the, the pressure of massification on the system. Yet, methods could be devised to give the universities more of a say in determining what kind of students they want. We have that in this report. And I don't want, well, I think the key word today is I don't want to go into details. <laughs> in the restructuring part of your report, you propose six items. A change in the Constitution, a new and a short university law, allowing for independent and multiple university systems, a modified Higher Education Council, Yuk, with reduced powers as a coordinating body, a rector's council much smaller than the current inter-university council, which currently numbers so 300 members, and an accreditation agency. In the four years since the report has been published, none of this has happened yet. Which one? is the most likely to happen first? Do you think York could evolve, or could we perhaps start an accreditation agency in the absence of a new constitution and law? Or perhaps is a new constitution coming? Which one do you think is the most likely to happen? This time we'll start with Ustu Noja. So Ashmi, I don't know. Uh, I think no, there has been enough debate in Turkey since the 90s on quality and accreditation. I think the system is ready uh, you know, for something to be done. There is some accumulation of knowledge and experience. There are 22 universities in Turkey who have picked up European University Association Quality Review, which is not accreditation, by the way. Uh, quality Review, and they, are not, they have not been supported by the state. They have done it through the, own fund, the funds that have been generated by themselves. Same is true. Uh, several universities have had their faculties of engineering uh, evaluated by the uh, Accreditation Board for Engineering Technology, and they have paid for it themselves. There is enough, and there is also a very interesting develop, development. There is an association of, uh, the association of deans of engineering schools in mm. Turkey. Mudek. It's a voluntary association, and they've started their own accreditation and evaluation process. There's a simil similar development in medicine and, and faculty of arts and sciences, too. So there's a lot happening out there from bottom up, I think, which the system has to look, recognize. But one of the very important things, again, I'm, I'm very much scared that in Turkey, Higher Education Council will pick it up as a function. It should be a separate authority. It should be an independent, separate authority which could produce its own data on quality and accreditation. That another independent body, a coordinating agency, like the Higher Education Council, could use. But it is very, very important that they should not be under the same roof. Very important. Dr. Um. Of those six that uh, we have listed, um, 
Inter-university council is almost trivial to accomplish. It can be done any time. Um, I don't find it realistic uh, to think that higher education council uh, will be shifted to a coordinating body. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rest, I think, the constitution, university law, and accreditation, they should be done together with an immediate change in constitution and the law. I don't mm -hmm. think we have the, the luxury <coughs> of delaying and putting them in a sequence. They should be done at once. All right, I'll, I'll move on to my closing question in the interest of time. Uh, over four years have passed since you first wrote the report. Are you more or less optimistic about the future of the Turkish university system now than four years ago? <laughs> Me? Cool. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm, I was very optimistic. Back then. Back then, right. Back then, I mean, we, we started working on this. We started working on this back in the early 2000s. I was a lot optimistic, but I'm not that optimistic now. Because uh, this is why I mentioned accreditation and quality, because the others pertain to the Constitution. This is, this is an attempt to think out of the box. It assumes constitutional change. <laughs> and I don't know when constitutional change would come. Uh, so uh, I'm optimistic not, uh, not for any legislation, but I'm optimistic because I see some dynamism in the system itself. That the universities, in the universities, I think that some questions are being asked. There are some experiments being done and the system seems to be challenging, challenging the straight jacket that it's in. And I hope one day it breaks the seams. Victor, mm -hmm. I wish I was 75, for example. <laughs> My mood keeps changing uh, almost daily. <laughs> I was pretty optimistic when I uh, received this invitation, uh, hoping that there will be some discussion about uh, solutions. And um, because of the jet lag, I woke up pretty early today and uh, thought of visiting the uh, website of Higher Education Council. And I was sorry to see that there was a declaration made uh, by the higher education itself about the principles of a new restructuring, talking about basic five items, which starts with diversity, continues with autonomy, and so far. And I couldn't find it. So, um, and uh, I was hoping that it will be implemented, and not being able to find it. I hope it is still there, but I couldn't find it. Uh, uh, I got a little demoralized. He was jet uh, <laughs> Could be, could be, because uh, I keep emphasizing that um, we tend to agree with the principles, and but uh, we fail to implement those principles, and the implementations are usually not in line with the principles. Uh, that makes me really uh, sorry to see certain um, proposals for legislation, which are in total contradiction with the principles. And um, I keep saying that diversification, decentralization, and to balance it, a quality assurance system ought to come together. With competition. To save with the system, competition. yes. Okay, well, uh, we've gone 45 minutes. I'd like to thank the panel and... Uh, Hocam, oturun siz, oturun. Oturun. Now I'd like to invite the rectors to the, their chairs. Uh, Abdullah Atalar, Bilkent University. Mustafa Aydın, Kadir Has University. Murat Barkan, Yaşar University. Nilgün Haloran, Ankara University. Ali Güngör, Bahçeşehir University. Ümran İnan, Koç University. Kemal Köymen, Maltepe University. Ender Suvacı, Anadolu University.
Funda Sivrikaya Şerifoğlu, Düzce University. Yani Derin Ural, İstanbul Technical University. Kadir Hocam, would you like to join us? Huh? Did I leave anyone out? I just read from the program. There might be other presidents or vice presidents in the audience. If so, please step up. Okay, the, the plan is to go for another 40 minutes or so and uh, let the university presidents and vice presidents touch upon some of the points raised in this discussion and debate. It, it seems to me that the most hotly debated parts were diversification and specialization, paradigm shift with the, the, uh, in, in the role of the, the state, uh, accreditation, uh, the new constitution. Um, perhaps I can give something to you that has not been discussed. Uh, the report was arguing that the demand supply gap is continuing to open up. But this is no longer true. Because of the capacity increases of 25 and 15 percent in 2008 and 2009, and because of the starting of new universities, we basically doubled the number of foundation universities in the last three years. So it seems that the queue is disappearing. But I, I'm wondering if you have the necessary academic staff to absorb this increased pressure of, of student quotas. Um, and, and are we studying the labor market demands when setting quotas for these programs? And perhaps a more provocative question, sh do, should we actually seek 100% penetration rate? Does every high school student need a university education? Uh, are you having an easy time filling your uh, ac academic positions? Maybe we can just start with that. Short questions and move on. Uh, short answers and move on. Go ahead, Ojan. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, as a rector of a, a foundation university, we have to react to, to market conditions immediately. So we have to adjust our quotas according to the needs of the uh, market. Otherwise, we can't attract students because the students actually have to pay and they, they'd like to see a return on their investment. The families would like to see a return on investment. So I think when it's uh, at the uh, foundation universities have to uh, react to market conditions. What about academic staff? Are you able to? Well, I think yes. Academic staff, uh, in not only all areas, but in some areas we have difficulty finding uh, faculty especially in areas where traditionally there is no Turkish presence. Mm. And in those areas we'd like to, of course, uh, we recruit uh, foreign staff. Uh, we have difficulties because of the highly centralized system uh, of uh, YÖK, which insists on you know, input control. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, one of our uh, foreign faculty members is applying to being a docent uh, ship and the uh, uh, our uh, government asks for the high school diploma yeah yeah and this poor guy is uh, trying to find his high school diploma uh, without the high school diploma even though he has the perfect uh, phd diploma from princeton university he can't because he can't that is, anyway, this is a highly centralized system. Uh, and uh, just last week, we received a letter from Jörg uh, that if you don't do this, there will be grave consequences. <laughs> <laughs> OK, could, could we perhaps hear from a, a state university about ability to staff new programs? Um. Good afternoon. I'm Ender Svoji, Vice Rector responsible for uh, Research and International Affairs. And uh, on behalf of Anadolu University delegation, I would like to thank all the organizers. Okay, um, actually, that the, although we are increasing the number of, you know, that the, the uh, seats available for the students, I think that the, we are also seeing that the, uh, this, uh, you know, prospective students are becoming much more and more selective. Because we see that, you know, we have also open uh, you know, seats in the classrooms, although we are offering the, you know, um, this uh, 
uh, dispositions. And what we have observed is basically that the last year, I think there were um, about 600,000, uh, you know, that uh, uh, available, you know, quotas for the students, and 10% uh, of these quotas were not used by the, you know, the students. And so it it is like basically delivering a message to us because it tells us that we should offer something different. And as a part of this, that we see as Anadolu University an opportunity to establish some dual diploma programs, so that the regular students can also take over from their, you know, that the junior or senior levels, and then you know they can also take an uh, offer from the foreign uh, universities and as a dual diploma programs. Um, uh, your question regarding that, you know, that the, the uh, getting the some uh, f faculty members in different areas. Um, I think that the, we are lucky in that sense because we are one of the, you know, the, the uh, well-established universities, and we are also offering the, you know, you know, different uh, research fundings, etc., in our internal funds, so that you know. Uh, for us, this is not a really a big problem. So we are, uh, you know, accommodating a good personnel and stuff. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Perhaps I could turn to a, a, a president who does not lead a well-established university. Funda Hocam, are you having a hard time finding uh, qualified academic staff uh, for your programs? Well, well, not actually, because Düzce University is very much, uh, very advantageously located between the two metropoles of Istanbul and Ankara. Mm -hmm. And Düzce is a wonderful city with many, many natural sites. And it's a peaceful, beautiful, green place to live in. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, and then to conduct research. So whenever we have an announcement for uh, empty positions, we always get more than we need. Uh, well, actually, the problem is uh, actually like just this. Um, we make an announcement for free academical positions, and we have to admit one of the candidates, no matter what. So we, we, we don't have a say in, um, we don't have the uh, opportunity to say, no, we don't like any one of you, <laughs> any one of the candidates. We have to hire some of the candidates. That's a big, big problem. Can for you interview them? Universities. Are you allowed uh, to interview is, them? No, no, no. There's no interview. But you, you can. <laughs> let's well, you let's can spell that, it out. The first qualified candidate must get the job, period. Yes. What, what does that mean? I didn't get it. Well, you can do interviews if you want to, but uh, you cannot say, no, we don't like you. We cannot work with you. You have to uh, hire one of the candidates applying to that empty position. You have to if hire the first one that qualifies. If you then, they, they go to the court, and the court decides that you have to hire one of those. Let's. Can I can I say a few words as well, please? Yep. Uh, can you please introduce uh, yes, yourself? My first? name is Abdullah Çavuşoğlu. Uh, and you are from, with? Uh, from Yıldırım Beyazıt University, a newly established uh, state university. I would like to say a few words uh, uh, about the university entrance exam. Uh, most of the rectors here are from foundation universities and they are uh, taking their uh, viewpoint from the foundation <coughs> university viewpoint. The, the public perception about the uh, universities is uh, entering a university is as though finding a job. Uh, taking this into consideration, it is very hard for the uh, state to, uh, to give the universities, especially the foundation universities and state universities, uh, to be able to do their own exam uh, to enter the, to the university. And uh, especially uh, considering the number of people uh, waiting in front of the university or expecting to f find their place at the universities, uh, this is very difficult and the public pressure is very high. Therefore, uh, I don't think that this would be acceptable for a, uh, for a near future. Okay? Okay, thank you. Uh Nilgün Hocam, Yıldırım Beyazıt, Yıldırım Beyazıt. Nilgün Hocam, you can basically mention what bothers you. What would you like to change in the system if you had the powers? What hurts your university the most? Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Nilgün Heller, I'm an uh, from Ankara University. First of all, uh, uh, I would change the education model. Uh, because uh, uh, students students uh, perception changed within last 10 years so uh, we should 
we should change education programs first. Mm. Uh, first, 10 years ago, we were putting students, and still, we are putting students to classrooms, and classrooms are teaching environment. Well, why can't you change for, programs? Well, what's keeping you from changing the programs? We are changing programs, but uh, not according to the development in the society or the needs, but we are changing because of, uh, as you said, changing is very difficult. Mm. And uh, academicians are resisting on uh, mm. changing educational programs. So we are the enemy, actually. Yeah, actually, we shouldn't resist on it first. Uh, and we should, for example, for example, 45 minutes lectures shouldn't be exist anymore. It's too long. I they think. don't exist in my university. Yeah. In our university, it is 45 minutes. Uh, I'm sure in many, many public universities, it's for fi 45 minutes. I don't think it prevents you from doing that, though. I don't think the university or school prevents you from that, doing that. You said 45 minutes is too long? Yeah, it's too long, She's I think. saying we should not be lecturing. We yeah, we should discuss. Preaching. We should change Active the learning. system. Active learning, yeah. yeah. So I think that's the I think topic of another conference. Perhaps if you could stick to problems of, of universities. And, uh, and also financial, uh, uh, financial support is very important. And it uh, uh, stops many things doing at the universities. But we cannot e expect everything from the government. So universities should create their own financial support, it's financial resources. Uh, for doing it, we should be very careful. We cannot just buy real estate and sell it just to get financial uh, source, money. We shouldn't get away our, from our mission. Uh, and we should also keep the uh, balance between disciplines. For example, maybe medical science can make money by selling, uh, making public service. service. but. Uh, social sciences or uh, some disciplines cannot make money, but they produce knowledge information. So we should be very careful by finding uh, financial resources, I think. That's up to the universities, as, as far as I know, establishing balances between disciplines. Mustafa Hocam, would you like to jump in? Yeah, the biggest, well, I'm from a foundation university, so my perspective might be distorted from the state universities. It's not working? Kadir Has. Kadir Has University. Yeah. Um, for us, the biggest problem seems to be the law itself. Uh, the law of, high, of higher education uh, in Turkey is too centralized and it's not it's planned for the state universities. It doesn't fit into the competitive nature of foundation or private universities. If you want to, for example, if you want to and open a new department, with a new name that doesn't exist in Turkey. You cannot. You know, York doesn't allow to open a new department with a new name which oh. doesn't exist. Hocam, let's say York did not. Let's not well, say does see, not. See, I mean, we haven't seen yet what the new York is going to do, but um, that happened to me a couple of years ago in a different university. Uh, what we were told, why don't you change that suggested name to something that already exists? Uh, then, after the establishing the department, after a couple of years, you can change it to the name that you want to. Uh, it's easier, because this is going around the law. This is the system in Turkey. Um, the power of uh, higher education council within the system, according to the law, is too permissive. You know, they are into everything. Um, you have to ask permission, and if you don't comply with the regulations, then you get the criticism. I'll give you an example. Um, we went through auditing a couple of months ago. Uh, one of the biggest criticisms is uh, for our university uh, is that we are not complying with the law um, for the governing bodies of the faculties. I'll, let me explain, for example. Um, in what the law says that the governing body of the faculty has certain number of professors, certain number of associates, and certain number of uh, assistant professors represented in the body. So what happens if you don't have associate professor in that faculty? There is no way. This is an impasse. 
you try to appoint somebody from another faculty, which doesn't allow, law doesn't allow you. If you don't appoint somebody from associate level, uh, you are I breaching the law. So there is no way out. Uh, the system is so inflexible. Uh, you cannot go around. So the sturdy box, the straight jacket. But in all fairness, I should mention that you did allow a brand new programs. For example, there's jewelry engineering and there's entrepreneurship. Those are both are brand new programs in Turkey. Uh, so it, it, it can happen with some difficulty. But, but I want to say something because the American University is the same. Ojam, I know you're the president, but we haven't opened the floor to the audience yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so hang on to your. Hang on to your horses. We have to be fair. You know, it, is like, it is the same system here, too. So yeah. you cannot even to change the course, then you have to jump through. Is Öktem Hocam? It's not the Yerk's business, actually. If you propose something which is not present in Turkey, then it goes to Inter-University Council, and they report to Yerk whether it's acceptable. Mm -hmm. So it's not Yerk's fault. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, but the I, problem is, it, it's the law. But the problem is, you send it to the competitors. <laughs> no. Uh, so, Imran Hocam, you, you're the target of all this criticism. <laughs> would you, would you like to defend yourself? Yeah, there is, uh, there is nothing that came to my desk that I did not approve. I mean, I, I think. Imran Hoca is the ch is the president of the Inter University Council. This this interesting body that has one rector and one rep from each university in Turkey, numbering 326 at the last right. count. A, a pretty large committee. Buyur Hoca. Yeah, it's uh, by the way uh, the next time a Koç University president will become the president of the Inter University Council is in 165 years. <laughs> it's it's because it goes, it goes by alphabetical right, it order. It goes by the by the year of founding. Uh, well, anyway, I, I think, I, I believe that in every aspect of human endeavor, uh, people and institutions produce the best and the most when they are the freest. So universities must, must uh, be able to control their own destiny. And they must be able to fail and rise and sink with that. They, they, just like the earlier discussions that we uh, heard. If a university uh, basically dilutes their standards for appointment of whatever, then they will not survive in the long run. Just like in the turn of the 1900s, in the American scene, there were so many universities. Uh, only the ones that are very good survived. And those are now 135, 125 old universities. So we must allow this to happen in Turkey. There are some exceptions. For example, the ÖSS system, the, the equality of opportunity that it brings to the Turkish students, is extremely important. My university has no problem filling its quotas. But if I was able to accept my own students, there would be no end to the phone calls of favoritism. And I would not be able to resist it. Because the phone calls would come from the very high levels. So I think the OSSA placement is a fantastic thing for Turkey. It's fantastic. And it should, it should not be replaced by anything. Because the universities cannot sustain the pressure uh, of favoritism. Even for dormitory assignments, for students approved through the SSS system, I get so many phone calls that, that uh, I think it would be impossible. But because we're such an imperfect society, we should stick with this imperfect system. Well, the SSA is, is an imperfect system, but it, correlations uh, show that uh, it does produce and correlate well with the, uh, with the outgoing student uh, performance uh, in life, in jobs, in every measure that you can look at it. There is a looseness in that correlation, but there is a correlation. So I think that it is a, it's an equality of opportunity, and, and, uh, and I think it's a system that fits us right now. The state and the um, foundation universities must trigger one another into excellence. So this has to be allowed. I think a lot of the foundation universities have differences among them, and, and this must be re-regulated also by new laws. I think I, I agree with Öktem Bey completely that not every university should do research. There should be vocational universities, there should be universities that just do teaching, there should be ones that do research and teaching. And this diversity must be allowed because it will, otherwise we are wasting resources of this uh, country. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hocam and then Abdul Hocam. I will 
take uh, issue with what uh, Imran Bey has said, a strong one too, because the OSSA system, the student selection system, is, is, a, is a bad system that we do very efficiently. <laughs> sometimes, we, sometimes we confuse those two. I mean, we do it very efficiently. It's one of the things that the Turkish higher education system has done very efficiently. It doesn't mean it's good. It works two ways. Two ways. It has killed the higher, uh, the uh, orta system in Turkey, mm. the lise system in Turkey. Yeah. <laughs> and in terms of selection, I agree with some of the points that Imran Bey is making, that it might be, I mean, whenever I say that the universities should be able to choose their own, select their own students, faculty, my colleagues, everybody tells me that in Turkey, this cannot be done because you're going to get phone calls. Granted, yes, but there might, there are solutions. I don't want to plug the report. In that report, we have devised a system in which the universities will have a say in terms of percentages yeah. of grades that are received in the lycée yeah. and a performance in a selection system a composite, but the university should decide on what kind of weights sh should be announced or assigned to those systems. I think it's vitally important for universities to be able to have a say on the choice of students. It's extremely important. Ajahn, this is how we admit foreign students today, by the way. We, we list our criteria on the website. It's transparent, it's defensible, and that's how we admit international students. Could and I, I don't could, get too many phone calls. Could, could, could I have uh, up to Well, uh, uh, this is a, a dif difficult subject. Uh, it's, uh, a, we'll uh, close it. Uh, well, I, I'd like to turn to uh, centralization of, sure. uh, of uh, higher education system. Uh, I think they, uh, some, some people argue that higher education councils should be removed. I don't agree with that at all. Uh, we need uh, a higher education council that uh, oversees the system, uh, more or less like the uh, state, uh, s uh, state, the board of trustees. In many states, there is something like that. It's very similar to higher education system, uh, higher education system of Turkey. But the present higher education system controls the inputs mm -hmm. rather than the outputs. So we try to uh, our uh, system. Actually, most of our government looks at the inputs mm -hmm. of the system, mm -hmm. tries to, as, as a control freak, as Üstün Ergüre said, as a control freak, our government controls the inputs of the system. It ne almost never looks at the outputs. So I think we should, and uh, in many respects, Turkey has achieved uh, a competitive uh, market system in many fields, not in higher education system. And to achieve this, I'd like to propose the Pell Grant system. The Pell Grant system, which is existing in US, uh, is instead of giving the money to universities directly, it gives the money to students. Mm -hmm. And yeah. students give the money to the universities that they choose. And this automatically, automatically in a market environment, as, uh, assigns the quotas, assigns the each university will decide their own tuition. Each university will decide their own quotas, whether they are private or uh, a public university. But the students have the checks. And this is easy to do politically because the government will show the clients, which are the students, that they are investing so much money in them. So instead of uh, giving the universities directly the funds, which is not so visible in the eyes of the students, if you give them checks that they, they cannot cash, of course, that they have to give it to a university, that this system will automatically solve the uh, centralization problem. OK, uh, someone who hasn't spoken yet, Murat Ujum? Yeah. Thanks, God. Uh, this is one of the f um, uh, very first uh, platform meetings that I'm not uh, taking the uh, closing remarks because of my 
the, the name of my university, it starts with the letter Y. So we're left at the, at the, at the end. And I said, it's just a little joke. I just wanted to... <laughs> I, I, just, I just wanted to uh, highlight something, something at the top of the uh, points already mentioned. Don't worry about the examinations and uh, nearly by 2017 we won't need it any longer because we are decreasing in terms of uh, population uh, numbers. We, we were nearly, uh, the, the increase rate was nearly 1.86 something in 1980s it now dropped down to uh, one point something, maybe a, a little less. In 1970, uh, in 1917, it will be uh, something around the uh, one uh, point eighty to something, which is so equivalent to what U uh, U.S. and United, uh, sorry, uh, European community has. So in those days, after uh, 2017s, 17s. Uh, there'll be around 800, uh, 850,000 uh, something on supply, and there'll be something relevant to that amount in, in, as, a, as a demand. So there will, there will uh, not be uh, examination, election, uh, selection examinations will be needed. Okay, thank d you. D d d d d these uh, records are due to my uh, Yeshua University uh, cosmic room uh, analysis. Okay, thank you. The second thing is, uh, oh. yes. Go ahead. Complain, complaints that doesn't work in the in the real uh, private market, so we don't complain. Uh, for the first time in Turkish, uh, the history of Turkish higher education, I think we have the opportunity to blow uh, get and catch the blows and uh, the winds in, in our uh, you know in our sails, because uh, after 9/11 effect, and the follow it is followed by the. Uh, series of economic crises going on around uh, all around the world uh, the, the uh, demand international student and staff demand is just snailing back to their countries so looking for some some places close culturally physically close to what uh, to, to their countries and in that respect we think Turkey has a serious advantage to catch great opportunity for international students thank you sir Ali Güngör, Bahçeşehir University. We are discussing a very important subject here because of the higher education. We have to remember Turkey has very high percentage young fellows and they want to go to university. Unfortunately, some political reasons, all the students try to send to the university. We abolish basically vocational schools. I think we have to consider to improve the values of the vocational schools instead of sending all the students to the universities. This is the, one of the serious problems in Turkey right now. Financially, uh, everybody asks if they give money, they ask questions. I believe the same thing through here in the United States also. When they supply money, they always ask what you are doing. We have to give Accountability. Some, yes, we have to give some uh, details about those money. In Turkey, everyone wants to get the money, but they don't want not, not to ask the, any question to me. I, I have to spend this money as much as, as I wanted the way. Unfortunately, we take the students to the university with the exams. I am not volunteer, but there is no choice at the moment because basically, it kills the student's logical mind. The students only thinks to put some cross to the answers without thinking. And this is the very important we have to consider. We take students to the universities with the exams, but when we assign the administrators, we never question those administrators. I think we have to put some rules. Who will become administrators? And in Turkey, I believe the president has very high power, maybe like king. When they say something, and you cannot abolish what they are saying. They never criticize themselves. We don't need that much power. I think those are the main problems in Turkey to be <laughs> questioned. OK, can Thank I perhaps you. turn to something that is uh, uh, near the, the heart of our, our deputy <laughs> minister? We talked about research and teaching. But there is an emerging role of universities in technology commercialization. 
exploitation of the know-how that's generated at the universities. Where do you think Turkey is? in this area? Do we have third generation universities that promote entrepreneurship? Do we have third generation universities that have incubators, accelerators, that license research, that actually generate, serve the, the local population as well as the nation and the economy? Uh, how is Turkey doing in this respect? Anyone? Go ahead. Thank you. I'm Dede Nural from the Istanbul Technical University. Thank you, Chairman and Tassa, for inviting us. Uh, ITU has served a big role in increasing public value in Turkey, not only nationally but internationally. And when we think about entrepreneurship, our university has a science park that is very successful. And when we look at the bridge between the university faculty and students and the researchers in uh, the science park, we see that the number of patents have been really uh, skyrocketing. So we see that uh, we've had a, a big catalyst with that science park on our campus. When we think about licensing, I want to also um, compare licensing to our graduates. Professor Atalar said that you know, we look at the input going into the universities, but how do we measure the output? And we've been thinking about that at our university, and we've done an accreditation uh, project with ABET that Professor uh, Argudar has talked about. And it was a big endeavor. It took us three years to apply for 23 programs, and that's actually the largest number of programs all over the world that was accredited at one time. So we have to give this public university a lot of credit for doing this. And now we want to see, well, the curriculum is accredited, but what about the graduates, how good are they? Mm -hmm. So we need to have a licensing system mm -hmm. for the professionals. Just like the medical schools have TUS, mm -hmm. we should have a system in place for our engineers. So we've actually taken a step ahead and worked with NCS in the United States that does the PE examinations for engineers in America. And for the first time, they're going to do their exam in Turkey in April for our graduating class. So this will be a measure for us to see the outcome. How good are we mm -hmm. in educating our engineers at ITU? We're very proud of our traditions, but we want to see where do we stand internationally. So we think, th think that this is a good benchmark that we would like to see all universities working with professional societies in Turkey to take that next step. Excellent point. Thank you. OK, I, I, I think that. Um, Really, the, the most important capital that any country has is the dynamic range of the human brain that in its young people. So I think we must channel the hopes and aspirations of these people in the right direction. And the one word that I didn't hear here in the last two days is serendipity. There's no Turkish equivalent, but serendipity is extremely important. We must make sure that research in Turkey is carried out not along a path that is specified uh, to preclude uh, serendipity and, and, and, and uh, discovery of things as you do uh, research, but, but one that encourages serendipity. So universities has, has a have a duty, I think, to instill uh, critical thinking and serendipitous discovery and, and uh, basically uh, channel the aspirations of their students in the direction of discovery. So we do that at Koch University in a different ways, but we have an Office of Technology Licensing, for example, like, like uh, most American universities do. Uh, every that's university is going to have to have one right. now. Every university will have to have one. Uh, I I, Kemal Ojam, I don't think you had an opportunity to say anything. Uh, any topic uh, uh, you... Uh, uh, well, uh, first of all, we all agree uh, that uh, we really have uh, an un healthy uh, higher education model and as uh, pointed out by the uh, chairman of higher education council it remains a challenging problem reforming the higher education council now <laughs> with that we have a lot of problems uh, it all uh, is due to the centralized uh, higher education model and uh, unfortunately, universities uh, do not have sufficient autonomy in making healthy uh, decisions in uh, many, uh, in all uh, aspects regarding managerial and financial uh, and uh, academic uh, uh, issues. Now, I want to give you uh, one uh, example. Uh, I think it will be uh, very interesting to hear. 
Uh, in order to open, establish a new department in a faculty, you have uh, to have at least three uh, faculty members plus one research assistant. And we filed, uh, you file your application to the Higher Education Council. By the time they are ready to make the decision, you should have your faculty members' names entered into their databases, database called YOCSIS. Now, how would you enter the faculty members' names into the database unless the decision has already been taken by the Higher Education Council? This is, <laughs> of course, the dilemma. Now, things like this, this is just a simple example. Now, I, well, we all agree, yes, uh, reform uh, should be uh, uh, uh, done and uh, the uh, Higher Education Council should be uh, uh, coordinating uh, body and hopefully we will have more decision power, more autonom autonomy uh, after these reforms. One more, one remark I should also make on the uh, university admission system, the OSSS uh, examination. Well, in my opinion, although uh, my uh, colleague here says, uh, yes, it is really a big, uh, it's a, an excellent uh, system, it really simplifies our jobs. We do not uh, spend hours and hours on decision making, uh, working in admission uh, committees. However, I, I honestly believe that it is a tor torturing process on the kids, on the families, and it's unfortunately exploiting the families for years. And I hope one day, one day we'll get rid of this system and we have, of course, uh, right now enough capacities. Universities can accommodate all the high school graduates. In fact, last year there were 100,000 uh, uh, seats available. We could not fill those spaces. Yet, yet we still have this exam which tortures the families and the students. And hopefully, somehow, thank we'll, you. Thank you, Ojem. we'll uh, get rid of uh, this. Ekten Ojem, go ahead. Uh, let me add a few things about the admission to universities. Um, if you look at the numbers um, of those who are placed in the universities, an appreciable amount um, is from those who are already in the universities. Mm -hmm. If I check the numbers, 19% last year, 23% previous year, and 21% uh, two years ago, they were all students who were already in university or they graduate from the university. This shows one thing. The programs in our universities do not match with the labor market needs. Mm. Our universities are unfortunately not responsive. So universities need to be pushed in that direction. Unfortunately, the straitjacket made the universities too static. Dynamism is totally lost. There must be a strong element of competition brought into the system. Let them act, let them do something wrong, learn, correct themselves, and respond to the needs. Sunajan? Well, listening to Ekdem and to you, um, I started to think back to a conference that I attended about a few months ago in Dubrovnik in Croatia where the, the participants were UNESCO chairs of higher education in Europe, mainly. And there, there was a very interesting contribution that got me thinking. It was a suggestion by a German to think very, to look very closely at the US community college system, mm. which is a very good point. With, with respect to Turkey too, that got me started thinking. Because one of the problems in the, in the Turkish system is we have the vocational education system right under the higher education, vocational higher education system under the higher education system. I think it should be completely separated. Mm. Should be completely separated. We should establish a vocational higher education system which has a very sensitive nose to market change, mm. to market demand. Mm. And uh, you can't do it under the system. I ran a university where we had a vocational school. In that vocational school, it was so rigid 
the, uh, the bureaucratic system, the appointment of faculty, and so on and so forth, that they had no time to think about market change. Every faculty in that school wanted to become a full-fledged faculty member of the university. There was no strategic planning, nothing. I would separate it, and I would make the vocational system as a competitor to the higher education system. Mm -hmm. It's not only competition between the universities, the w universities within the higher education system, I think there should be competition between systems in Turkey, one being the vocational system and the higher education system. This would also help self solve the mission drift <coughs> problems in the higher education system itself. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, uh, this is again an, an attempt to think out of the box mm -hmm. because uh, and if you do something like that, if the, the uh, vocational system should be very much integrated with the real sector or the, the industrial sector, That's true. I think. Hmm? Yeah, excellent point. Well, I, I know we all have a lot of things to say, but I would like the audience to lead us a little bit now, and I'll give you 20 minutes of question and answer. Well, our deputy minister has to leave, and then he wants to say a few words. Yeah, before he leaves, thank you. So let's have the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much again for this wonderful meeting. And I benefited personally a lot from this, and it will certainly reflect on the job we do from now on. What I would like to see is that our universities, rather than talking about these nitty gritties, First of all, we should all think about what, would be, what should be the role of the university in Turkish society. Unfortunately, I did not hear much about this today. Yesterday, in my speech, or in the discussion, I was trying to bring that point that we should really think about the role of the universities, role of the research institutions, and role of the faculty and the government. What should be the vision, and the way ahead. Based on that, we should, of course, discuss all these nitty gritties. So therefore, I would uh, request that we all, first of all, discuss what should be the role of our universities. What I also observed is that whoever gets the power, in the uh, directors of the university, they are like king. They are more, more powerful than the prime minister within their university. Nobody can say anything about them, etc. So we should, when we complain about centralization and this military order that we all complain that's coming down from Europe uh, starting from 1982, we should see that rectors themselves in the university, they should not act like that. They should use their authority in a democratic way. We don't see that as well. So thank you very much for this forum, and I just want to voice this concern. And we should also, we, why do we have the universities? What is their role? And how they should help our country to go to our expectation in 10 years' time and 20 years? How can we surpass Germany? What should be our role? We should be concentrating on this. And this is my job, and I hope we can all think in this direction. And I'm sure we will have a good new university order and everything. But we should never forget that the aim is to catch fish. So we can talk about how the ship should be, etc. But we should never forget the final aim, <coughs> to help our people, to help our country to get better. Thank you very much. And I hope we can get together again. Continuing with the session. Um, my name is Kovanj Birsoy from MIT. Uh, uh, as you all know, I think um, arguably why US, system is, uh, US resource system is better is the tenure track system, such that there's a check on the faculty every three to five years. I know some private universities have the system, but I wonder 
is there any planning on implementing such a system in Turkey, or would you believe that that system would work in Turkey? Thank you. Uh, who did you address the question to? I guess everybody. Anybody who wants, who jumps first? Kemal Hocam, buyurun. Well, the system works quite differently uh, in Turkey. We have state universities and foundation universities. In foundation universities, the university, the faculty members uh, are uh, working based on labor uh, law. So practically, we have a contract with our faculty uh, member, a yearly contract, if you, if you like, or uh, more than one year. But uh, in uh, state universities, it's different. It's a, a lifetime uh, tenure, as I uh, know. OK, thank you, Ojem. Hi, my name is Eda Cengiz. I'm faculty at Yale. And um, I have a question for the whole group. This crowd is well aware that research is is extremely important. It's the driving force be behind innovation. And um, unfortunately, in Turkey, the major support comes from the, uh, the government. And I say unfortunately because government funds are limited. I don't have statistics to base this. This is my personal observation. Now we have many companies, um, very powerful, big companies. I'm, glad, I'm uh, pleased to see that they're supporting some of the uh, higher education you know, universities. But is there a system in Turkey that will motivate these companies to um, give money, give grants to support research, and not only within their university, but overall to you know anybody who's interested in research. Thank you. Sponsored research. We have a CEO in the panel, Abdul Hoca. <laughs> well, there, there are uh, companies which uh, uh, give contract research to universities. Not many, but uh, the numbers are increasing. So uh, some universities do uh, contract research for uh, companies, in addition to uh, TÜBİTAK funds, which have uh, tremendously increased in the last uh, five or six years. And this actually, the system that's uh, TÜBİTAK implementing, the, uh, the project grant system, is very similar to what NSF or NIH is doing in, in US, very similar. Uh, so it's, uh, and it's, a, it's a very competitive system, and that uh, creates a competition within the faculty members uh, in Turkey. So that's, uh, I think in the last five or six years, as you, if you look at the numbers, <coughs> paper counts, uh, there is a tremendous increase, a, almost an exponential increase in number of papers in Turkey, although there is not a corresponding increase in the, uh, uh, the citation counts. But uh, I think the next, in, in the next 10 years, we would uh, be in a position to improve the uh, impact of the papers that's coming out of the, paper, uh, the projects as the competition improves. Hocam, can you please pass it to Anadolu University? Sponsored research. Are companies willing to sponsor research? Go ahead. Um, actually, that I'm uh, one of the owner of the spin-off companies, so that's why that you know I can uh, uh, talk to you from you know one of my um, heads. Um, actually, that the, in Turkey, I also so, you know lived in the United States. I did my masters and PhD there and worked here as a researcher. Um, in Turkey, this uh, you know sponsorship from the companies for the research is now increasing, as um, Professor Atalar mentioned. And I think that now also there is more and more push from the, you know, that the government to the companies that the, to sponsor the, the, the projects. And now that the, there are new establishments by the companies um, which have uh, more than 50 researchers and they can establish the, you know, their own research centers. And this has lots of you know, that the, the advantages for the companies and they are really um, having an advantage of this, and the, one of the uh, you know that the expectations from these R and D centers is that the, to work with the universities. So therefore, this basically takes the, the, these big companies in Turkey uh, and uh, force them to work with the you know that the universities. And now we are in a situation that you know that the, all the companies are looking for the the, the, the uh, researchers in the universities. This is really the, like a heaven for the, you know the, the, the Turkish. Um, faculty members because we, uh, who would like to involve in research. Now that we are in a situation that we are getting lots of offers 
from the companies, but we are limited. We have only limited time, and then we have only limited capabilities. And that that is really uh, very promising and very you know uh, feeling very well f f from uh, a researcher point of view. Um, I should also mention that, that there are some good examples, but that this is a rare situation. Uh, one of these establishment is in our university that uh, we have the Ceramic Research Center, which is a joint venture between Anadolu University, 50% of uh, the share belongs to the Anadolu University, and the 50% belongs to 19 ceramic companies, which are basically uh, uh, uh, performing uh, ceramic production in Turkey. So we are trying to increase these numbers to uh, create the joint ventures between the universities and also the you know um, the, uh, the companies. <laughs> and excellent example of inter-university uh, co collaboration. Thank you, sir. University industry collaboration. Hello, uh, my name is Farhat Chan uh, from Sunni Hotel Albany. Uh, uh, I have a question for you all, and I just noticed when you were talking, uh, there's a lack of communication between universities and cooperation. Uh, should we uh, promote? cooperation and communication between universities as well as competition. Collaboration between universities, another hot topic. Yes, sir. Murat Hocam. Uh, actually, uh, I was just trying to take the floor for, for an answer to yours. And, uh, Hocam, please uh, answer the last question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will. Thank you. If you let me. Uh, we have, we have a very specific uh, tryout uh, study in, in Izmir scale. There's nine university of Izmir, regardless of whether they're a uh, foundation or uh, government. They br brought together all their efforts to, to, to get in touch with the, uh, the commercial side and the industrial side so that get, they get their uh, city scale organization concentrated on the research-based studies to be provoked. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question is to Ustun uh, uh, You mentioned tuition for state universities, uh, and they, you said that students can take a loan. Uh, how do you think that will be possible if, for repayments in the loan? Do you think that system could exist uh, if such thing happened? Will they be able to find jobs in the economy? Will the universities have career centers that will allow them to find those jobs? Very relevant and loaded questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, all I'm, all I'm saying is that I pointed out to the inequities in the system. I mean, the system as it is right now is not very equitable, not socially just. And uh, of course, we need solutions. I mean, income distribution is not, is not, uh, is, is not you know, is, is bad in Turkey. But all the points you raise that we need a system. Now, we, a system of loans, I mentioned it. Without the state intervening and providing and making it lucrative for banks or possible, giving incentives for banks to come up with loans, I think it will be difficult. We, need to, we, we have to rethink. Uh, we have to do some original thinking on these issues. Scholarship systems. How do, how do you, how would you like to you know how would you raise the money? What kind of the state has to think about it. The state instead of being concerned with nitty gritty of running a university like hiring, or firing, or programs and things like that, should be concentrating on solving these kinds of problems. I don't have an answer right now. I mean, but I know what the issues are. And, and the, the questions you, uh, you raise are very relevant, but I think they could not be answered by the private sector by itself. It has to be, the state has to play a leading role, an yes. enabling role, rather than a controlling role. Um, I'm Sinan Tumar from SAP Research. Uh, uh, European Union. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, European Union has created the framework program, and I'm sure you are all aware of it. And uh, in the sixth framework program, uh, please don't quote me on these numbers, I, they may not be accurate. But uh, since uh, Turkey is not an EU member, uh, Turkey contributed 360 million euros to the sixth framework. And uh, I think only 50% of those funds came back to Turkey. Yes. In the seventh framework program, another couple of hundred million euros contributed. And by fact, I know that uh, 
Finally, the uh, Turkish government requested 75 million euro back from the European Commission uh, because those funds were not utilized. My question is, why aren't the universities fully utilizing these funds? What is the incentive for the faculty to utilize these funds? What's the incentive for faculty to give, present a proposal? Because proposal takes three months to write. Okay. So, uh, can somebody uh, respond to that? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I respond? Uh, uh, I worked at the uh, Tubiduck uh, Science Board for eight years. And at the beginning of, uh, it, in our first meeting, uh, I looked at the numbers. The Tubiduck, the main founding, uh, founding agency for Turkish uh, academia, was not funding. Only 5% of the Tubitak's budget went to funding. 85%, 95% remained on, uh, in, within the Tubitak itself, actually in the form of uh, what's called repo. <laughs> that is to say, Tubitak did not spend its money, but backed it to get interest rate, interest. That was the fact. Uh, it wasn't spending it's, uh, the money that the government was giving to them for funding. The, the largest uh, uh, project was only $5,000. In the last, and of course, Turkish academia didn't know how to write grants. Didn't. So, and at the very same time, when the government decided to expand into European Union, they realized that Turkish academia is not ready for it. But it started. So in the first sixth framework, you're right, only half of the money is recovered. But in the meantime, through Tubitak funds, now there is a, there is a big change in academia where the faculty members are writing grants in the first time. Uh, and the Tubitak is spending its money. It's not putting its money in banks. Uh, so that, uh, that has improved. That's why in the seventh framework, uh, there is a better performance. Okay, I think there's one comment on this real quick. I have to make a comment on this. Really ready to write grants to European Union. You know, they were not trained to do this. And a couple of years ago, TASA actually organized a, a, a, a think, think tank with Tubitak. So there was TASA Tubitak meeting, and we actually uh, gathered about 50 scholars from United States. We brought them to Tubitak. We were with them for about maybe a week, and then from that, uh, about 10 or 15 projects evolved. And I think this is a very uh, important thing that TASA can contribute. Uh, to uh, the Turkish um, you know, power in getting those money back to Turkish universities. Because we keep writing NIH grants, we keep writing NSF grants, we know how to write good gr those grants. So we should be able to help you and team up with you and then so that we increase the Turkish you know, presence in those money spent uh, in the European Union. And I think the problem is that um, what I find, like I'm a faculty at the Department of Neurology, and I wanted to be an adjunct faculty at a Turkish university so that I can actually form collaborations with a Turkish colleague who is working in similar lines with, m with me so that I can, you know, get them on the NIH grant that I'm writing. Or we can together write an EU grant. I applied to Boston University, I was declined. I would apply to another university, I was declined. Whichever university I applied, they declined. They said, we don't have it in our rules. So I think uh, if when we talk about rules and regulations, if we make this something that you know, happens, there are so many faculties over here that would be willing to help the Turkish professors in Turkish universities to get more involved with the EU grants, with American grants, and IH grants, and so forth. And I know that this is a system that works with Israel, United States, or China, or some, and uh, even um, um, India. So this is something that we should actually be actively thinking about. And Thank you. In Th line with this, we actually started that, and that would be the second step that TASA can actually be involved. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, take note. Erhan, uh, I'd, I'd like to add something to that. It's a very, very good comment, but we have to make a differentiation. Applying for European grants is an art in itself. 
because you're applying to a very bureaucratic system. And TASA could, of course, be how, I mean, I would very much, I'm very much in favor of TASA being a leader in applying for grants all over the world. But Europe is another game. That I'd like to mention. And, but uh, ju uh, let, let, let me finish. The Turkish universities are, some of them, are responding to the challenge. For example, the Sabancı University has established an office in which the, uh, the academics get a lot of help in writing, uh, in writing proposals for the European grants. So it is something that has to be solved within the context of Europe, I think, because uh, Europeans themselves are very bureaucratic, by the way. Okay, right. thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm Güneş uh, from Medical College of Virginia. Uh, uh, and my question is with all due respect to directors, uh, is, do you all have to come to United States to express yourselves uh, to the president of higher council? You know, it's, it's very important that we all hear you, not listen also, we hear you here under the umbrella of University of Maryland. But uh, is it like mm, uh, Dr. Argider is I think has proposed uh, his book for the last, uh, or his proposal since 2008. It's like uh, his, this fourth year proposal, and uh, the government is with us for the last 10 years. Uh, how often do you uh, come along? How often do you express yourselves? You know, how do you talk with uh, each, each other, uh, the government side, the president of higher education, and yourselves in Turkey, in Ankara, or in Istanbul? So. This is, uh, and one other question. We were talking about universities, but we never mentioned the uh, well-being of students at universities. I'm a graduate from the Hacettepe Medical School. You know, uh, I, I really try hard through the national exam, and I was very unhappy through my medic medical education, which I didn't even know at age 17, what was I picking? Uh, so not only me, two million students, I think at least 90% doesn't know what they are going to study through their life what their destiny is. So could you please comment on your well-being of your students, uh, their happiness, and you know, their destinies? Thank you very much. Boy. <laughs> Fundo Hocam. You're loaded. Buyur Hocam. Thank you. Well, I would like to answer the first part. Um, ever since our new president has been appointed, we have been coming together more often than ever. I have been invited to two different gatherings with the directors and with the president, and we have been sharing ideas. And we, I have personally much hope that those ideas will be taken seriously by our president and the new higher education council. But there is another important, very important issue, at, which I will shortly want to make a, a, a, a point of. Um, the, the, even Professor Argüdar and Professor Vardar in their report uh, stick to some of the elements of the um, present system of our higher education. For example, I am currently being sued by, because I um, form commissions from different disciplines of the university to do on a project of the university. And by that, uh, I am sued um, sharing the uh, responsibility and power of the uh, deans of the different faculties. Although the, the, you know, the, the contemporary world is about interdisciplinary teams and teamwork and etc., our system does not allow new ways of making, uh, pursuing projects. And the new system also does not allow us to be democratic. Uh, our pr deputy minister is uh, already gone. I was going to give that example to him. Uh, in our university, uh, every decision is based on the boards of the university uh, units. Uh, but because of that, you might have troubles. Because 2547, the, the law, does not allow you to do that. So even if you want to be democratic, you can be sued by doing uh, this by, by boards, by commissions, etc. So there is this big dilemma. The, the, the new system should be a really big new reform, not a change of small parts of the law, not a change of small parts of the system, but it should be retaught all from scratch, I think. Well, I, I apologize for being a dictator, uh, but we're already four minutes late, and I don't want to prolong this any further. I know there's lots more questions. Um, I, I wish the deputy minister would have stayed around. Uh, universities are agents of change. They're the en engines of innovation and engines of economy, but not in a straight jacket. That would sum up the, the session, I think.